Greetings everyone, this is Raul speaking, and welcome to our fifth video on experimental neuroscience techniques. This week's video is dedicated to introducing students to genetically encoded calcium indicators. A central goal of neuroscience research is to understand the activity of neurons, networks of neurons, and how their activity results in behaviors. To this end, Genetically encoded fluorescence indicators are a tool used to read out neural activity. There are many different types of sensors that read out different signals, but in today's video, we will focus exclusively on genetically encoded calcium indicators. We will talk about how these work and their advantages and disadvantages. Let's begin our discussion by first clarifying why calcium. Calcium is a second messenger of neural activity. Increases in activity induce the influx of calcium through many different routes. So as you can see in the image below, under resting conditions, the cytoplasmic concentration of calcium is relatively low. In response to an increase in activity, such as an action potential firing, depolarization of the cell membrane results in the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. This causes an increase in intracellular calcium that is slowly cleared out of the cell. Thus, intracellular calcium can be used as a proxy for a given neuron's activity. There are many types of fluorescent calcium indicators with many different types of fluorescence mechanisms. Today, we will highlight just one type, and that is single fluorophore calcium indicators, specifically the GCAMP family. In general, you can use virus-mediated delivery of the GCAMP transgene to express GCAMP in a cellular population of interest. Once the sensor is expressed, the binding of calcium ions to the sensor causes a conformational change that results in increased light emission, an increase in fluorescence. Once your sensor is expressed in cells, you are ready to image and analyze the calcium dynamics of neurons. In this short video, we can watch how all of this comes together. The flickering activity we observe is the fluorescent calcium indicator in action, reading out neural activity. Neurons can be further isolated and their fluorescence activity is plotted and analyzed as a function of time, as is demonstrated here. Both calcium imaging and electrophysiological techniques allow you to interrogate neural activity at many scales in vitro and in vivo. With calcium imaging, in vitro experiments can be accomplished in cultured neurons or in brain slices by imaging the tissue under a microscope outfitted for calcium imaging, such as the one pictured on the left. In this example on the right, we are looking at cultured neurons from the dorsal root ganglion fluorescing after they were loaded with a calcium sensitive dye. In vivo experiments can be accomplished in one of two ways. Head fixed two photon calcium imaging gives you high resolution data from a large population of neurons, but the animal is not free to behave naturally. Using the recently invented miniscope preparation, scientists can accomplish calcium imaging in freely behaving animals. Now, let's talk about some advantages of genetically encoded calcium indicators. First, genetic encoding allows for imaging of a small subset or specific populations of neurons. In vivo electrophysiology cannot achieve this degree of cell type specificity. Next, imaging techniques allow for the imaging of thousands of neurons simultaneously, giving you information about their activity and their location, 
This allows for the analyses of any spatiotemporal patterns. Lastly, these techniques tend to be minimally invasive. Unlike the implantation of electrodes, imaging can usually be accomplished through a thinned skull or a cranial window. Lastly, let's discuss the disadvantages of genetically encoded calcium indicators. First, these sensors do not report some of the smaller scale features of a neuron's activity. For example, you cannot ascertain the activation of specific receptors or specific currents or hyperpolarizing events from calcium imaging alone. And these sensors do not report subthreshold changes in activity. Lastly, but most importantly, calcium signals are not a direct proxy for action potential firing. And this is because of the slower kinetics of calcium entering and being cleared from the cell. According to Lin and Schnitzer, calculation of spike rates can reach 40 to 60% in accuracy. Thank you.